Thank you very much. It is a great honor for me to be here at this wonderful symposium with all of these wonderful uh, scientists. It's truly a career highlight and an honor. The title of my talk is The Primary Function of Consciousness in the Brain. For this presentation, when speaking about consciousness, I am speaking about the most basic form of consciousness. If an, an organism has an experience of any kind, it has the kind of consciousness I'm interested in. I'm not speaking about higher level forms of consciousness such as self-awareness, cultural awareness, nostalgia. I'm speaking about very low level, if there is something it is like to be that organism, using Nagel's classic definition. As he said, if there is something like it is to be a creature, then that creature is a conscious entity. From this standpoint, there is something it is like to be human and experience breathlessness, the color red, or the urge to breathe. When this research started, claims about the, the function of consciousness were very lofty claims, that consciousness added a very high level function to the nervous system. Ideas that consciousness was primarily for language, for mental time travel, for semantic representation, for the meaningful interpretation of situations, for theory of mind, for the formation of the self, for social development. In fact, some, at that time, people were proposing that if one is raised alone on an island and does not interact with other humans, that person may not develop consciousness. So when this research started, the theories about the function of consciousness were very high level. The theory presented today uh, proposes that conscious states serve a much more lower nuts and boltsy function, one that is quite specific, very well circumscribed in the nervous system, and is used only for certain tasks, and is a lot low level compared to what was proposed before. Actually, one question for all of us at this wonderful institute is, what is the most fit basic function in the nervous system that requires conscious states or consciousness? And that is uh, the approach I'm going to be presenting today. So what is the most basic brain function that requires consciousness? My approach, being a naturalist uh, and growing up studying reptiles, is descriptive, not normative. I am describing what consciousness does in the human nervous system and what it is as a product of evolution. I am not describing how the system should be designed, which would be a normative approach. Back then, when this research started, people would compare the first time you perform an action and the one millionth time you perform an action and claim that the first is conscious and that the latter is automatized or unconscious. So tying your shoes for the first time is conscious, the one millionth time is presumably less conscious. This contrast is not as stark as the contrast I want to focus on today, which is the contrast between things that you are almost always conscious of, such as pain and the urge to breathe when holding your breath, and things that you are often never conscious of, such as the pupillary reflex, the mediation of a reflexive blink, peristalsis in the gut, or reflexive pain withdrawal. So this contrast is a more stark contrast between something that you're usually aware of, things you're never aware of. It's not the contrast of years before, the first time you perform an action, and then the subsequent times when it becomes more automatized. As Dr. Bars would tell you, um, uh, uh, that kind of automaticity conflates conscious processing with attentional changes. So this is a starker contrast. So if you compare something like the pupillary reflex or peristalsis with uh, something like enduring pain, holding your breath, the difference is not one of controllability, complexity, feedback, memory, semantics, or how action-like the events are. Mind that if a Martian came to Earth and saw someone with light blue eyes and that person's pupils dilated because of changes in the light and, uh, conditions of the room, that the Martian would write down behavior, the pupils dilated. If that person then blinked reflexively, the Martian would write down there was a closure of the eyes. If the person blinked voluntarily, the Martian would also jot that down as an action. So all of these things are variable forms of action. What we say is, well, one of them is associated with my consciousness and the other ones aren't. The reflexive one tend, tend not to be. People are reflex, certainly not. Well, we have to make that contrast and find out why some of these events are always reliably coupled with conscious processing and other events are not. So this idea 
we start looking at the complexity of unconscious action. In the 19th century, the great neurologist, Hewlett Jackson, observed very complicated behaviors that occur during epileptic seizures in which people are presumably unconscious. And there are cases of people who start a seizure and they will sing a song from start to finish unconsciously. William James spoke about unconscious actions in habit and idiomotor theory. The Stroop effect involves the un act unintentional activation of action plans. The flanker task. Lermite's observations of utilization behavior where people cannot suppress actions toward action-related stimuli. Priming research. Blind sight. Milner and Goodale showing the difference between consciousness for perception and then the unconscious control of action. The associations between perception and action. Illusions of authorship. So what this shows you is all of those things that we call unconscious are not necessarily dumb, less controlled in a sense, involving less feedback, involving less complexity. That's just my own research showing that. Um, the idea that has come about is that the primary difference between something like the pupillary reflex and responding to pain is that the amount of different kinds of information integrated for an adaptive response is different in the conscious case than in the unconscious case. So if I'm carrying a hot dish of food but it's expensive china, I may not drop the food. If I'm holding my breath but underwater, although I have the urge to inhale, which is a very strong urge, I don't. So there's a kind of modulation about from different kinds of information that are integrated to yield to adaptive action you, one does not get such kinds of overarching integrations for the unconscious actions. That's why, historically, if you go to a neurology department, as I'm in, people speak about unconscious actions as being irrational or not taking into account certain kinds of information. You should not sing a song right now. You should not drop that hot dish of food right now. You should not inhale right now. I used to work as a, at a pharmacy when I was in undergrad. I worked full-time as a pharmacy tech. And once in a while, somebody would open a jar of an acid, and everybody would say, don't inhale, because you should not inhale the acid, which is everywhere in the air. And I remember you're just holding in mind, don't inhale, don't inhale, don't inhale, until someone closes the jar. I am integrating information that leads to adaptive action. For reflexive behaviors, you don't have this level of integration. So you would, uh, reflexively withdraw your hand from a hot stove. You reflexively inhale. Actually, it's not that you need consciousness for action. Because in many cases, the moment you become unconscious, as when underwater, that's when you do perform an action and you inhale reflexively. So when, God forbid, someone perishes while underwater, they actually die not from apoxia, they die from drinking the water. When you're carrying a hot dish of food, if you became momentarily unconscious, you would do the drop reflex. In epileptic seizures and in other neurological conditions, you see these very sophisticated actions. So it's not that you need it for action. You need consciousness for a certain kind of action that involves integration. This led to the integration consensus. Professor Bars was the main proponent of this approach. And today, there's a consensus that conscious processing affords a certain kind of integration in some kind of workspace that unconscious processing cannot afford. If you look at things like complexity, top-down processing, semantics, control through feedback loops, you find each of those things in conscious and unconscious actions. What you do not find in the unconscious ones is this level of integration. So anarchic hand syndrome, automatisms, these are all behaviors that are complex that involve a lot of integration, but not as much as conscious integration. Consistent with the integration consensus, neural evidence reveals that compared to unconsciously mediated actions, consciously mediated actions involve more brain areas and more widespread networks of activation. So this is really great. We have this theoretical account that for conscious action, you have this wider level of, broad, broader level of integration of information. Guess what? Neurally, you find this. When an action is conscious versus unconscious, it involves a broader level. Here is a recent example from a paper that came out in Science. A paper came out last week, uh, in also I think in Science, by Logothetis that comes to the same point. And here they're saying that when people are unconscious because they're in a vegetative state and then they become conscious, once they're conscious, you have this widespread network of activation. Here, they have a very specific hypothesis that that network of activation requires frontal cortex. Sir Francis Crick had the idea that the wide level of integration must involve frontal cortex. Last week, Logothetis paper on binocular rivalry also isolated frontal cortex in high frequencies. However, there are really strong accounts that suggest that it's 
that frontal cortex is not necessary and that it's thalamic areas or mesencephalic areas and very strong evidence for that. And then there are accounts that parietal areas are very important. So here's my own research on this neuroanatomical correlates of consciousness. Uh, here's the paper from last week, Logothetis, claiming that Sir Francis Crick was correct, that you need frontal cortex, and that Sir Francis Crick was correct, you also need really high frequencies in the gamma range. So, what we have here in the Summer Institute are, there are really strong frontal accounts, that you need a frontal cortex activation in this widespread network, that that's essential or, and, and constitutes consciousness. You have mesencephalic accounts dating back to uh, Jasper and Penfield and Professor Merker today is reviving those really important accounts. Thalamocortical accounts, parietal accounts. If you get an electrode and you stimulate someone's motor cortex, people will perform an action, and then they may say, oh, I'm not aware that I performed an action. This is done by Sirigu and Desmerger. If you activate parietal cortex, people will say, I felt the urge to move my finger, but they didn't move it. If you stimulate parietal cortex more, they move their finger, sorry, if you stimulate frontal cortex more, they say, I move my finger, when in fact they did it. So the sensorium, the parietal cortex, activation there, people feel urges or believe they did acts they didn't do. Motor cortex, you get the act, they don't know that they did it. So there are really strong parietal accounts. Then there are frontal parietal accounts and there are frontal temporal accounts. Each of these accounts, they're very strong. My question to you is, we do not have a consensus regarding the neuroanatomical substrates that constitute consciousness. This is not neurodynamics. It's not saying whether it's 40 hertz, 30 hertz, 20 hertz. This is a level of a lack of consensus at the level of gross anatomy. This is a fundamental question that the field needs to address. It's obviously not all the brain. You don't, it, when you remove the cerebellum, people stay conscious. When you remove the amygdala, people stay conscious. HM was conscious, had no hippocampus. Um, basal ganglia, you don't need them to be conscious. So there are many regions whose absent leave the nervous system capable of being conscious. But we still don't have a level of consensus at the neuroanatomical level of what regions are critical. And all the accounts are really strong. So it turns out that although it is difficult to home in on the neuroanatomical correlates of conscious states, we can start looking at the kinds of integration that seem to require conscious states and the kinds of integration that do not. So the integration consensus is beautiful. And then you ask, well, what's the most basic integration that requires conscious states? What form of integration reveals this? Well, I love the integration consensus, but there's one problem with it. The whole nervous system is about integration. Sir Charles Sherrington noted this. The whole nervous system is about integration. So saying, hey, the thing that consciousness adds to the nervous system is integration. Well, integration was there. Integration is a general property of the nervous system. Even a reflex involves integration. The pupillary reflex involves a lot of integration. So instead of presenting to you all the experiments that I've done over the years, which have bored scores of subjects, I will have you participate in all my experiments. You will provide the data that support these conclusions today. And no consent forms will be administered, so don't sue me. OK. <laughs> Let's say this is your brain. Here's your mind. What integrations can occur unconsciously? Well, we know that the module that does the shape of an object, the motion of an object, and the color of an object are all different uh, uh, modules, right? V4, V5, MT. That integration or sensory integration within a modality, we know that occurs unconsciously. You look at the orange, the color and the shape are there for you for free. There's the unconscious integration, bzzz, right? Now, that's within the visual modality. What about across modalities? There are scores of sensory illusions that are based on intermodal integrations that are unconscious. We're going to have one today. We're going to experience one today. All right. Smooth muscle. I spend a lot of time in my neurology department studying smooth muscle. It is incredibly complicated. It's like the cerebellum type complicated stuff. You know, when you catch a ball, they say your brain does calculus, even though you don't know calculus. It's that kind of thing. So there's a lot of really complex plexuses in the nervous system, in the enteric nervous system, that are highly complicated. And in motor programs, you have an incredible amount of integration, as the research by Rosenbaum, Grossberg, and others shows you. When you grab an object, there's all these integrations. And those programs 
are computed on the fly. You're, every time you ex exhibit a motor program, it's pretty much a novel no, motor program. So what you say is, well, Professor Mozzarella, that's great. You have integration of perception, intersensory perception occurring unconsciously. Maybe the thing that you need conscious integration for is linking perception to action. That's a really good guess. Integrations within perception and action can occur unconsciously, as in motor programming and all that, but to link them. So perception to motor. Well, this perception to motor coupling has been called by Wolfgang Prince and colleagues, efference binding. Efference binding can occur unconsciously. It occurs unconsciously in reflexes, in pain withdrawal when you remove your hand from a hot dish. That's reflexive perception to action coupling. And also subliminal stimuli can elicit motor responses. So classic research done in the 60s show this. So stimulus response binding too can occur unconsciously. Afferent binding is sensory binding, whether within a modality or across modalities. That can happen unconsciously. Ventriloquism, it's not a bizarre thing. It happens every day when you watch television and you think the sound is coming out of someone's mouth, when in fact it's coming from a speaker far away, or in the movie theater when you think the sound came out of Tom Cruise's mouth and it actually came from the speakers at the back. That's the ventriloquist effect. There are hundreds of intersensory illusions based on unconscious integration of perceptual information. Here's the classic McGurk effect. Everybody look. Watch this person. Tell me what this person is uttering. Oh. Oh, the contact on this thing. Well, I'll get it to work. I was in a band. I could fix these jacks. Wait. All right. My whole life, all, every problem has been due to jacks. <laughs> this jack's bad. All right, one more time, one more time. All right, I got it perfect. Don't breathe, Ezekiel. Well, if you're a native English speaker, everybody perceives this person saying da, 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 da. But if you actually look away, what your auditory system receives is actually ba. Ready? Look away. Look it up on YouTube and hear it. On there. it, it is remarkable. I've seen it a million times. So the, what you actually hear, the ear receives ba. The visual system receives ga. The person is mouthing ga. The visual system says, oh, he said ba. The, uh, uh, the auditory, the visual system says, he said ga. The auditory system says, no, 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 he said ba. There's conflict. It's resolved in a principled fashion. You perceive da. This is unconscious sensory integration. This can occur unconsciously. There's hundreds of such kinds of uh, unconscious sensory integrations. Then in smooth muscle and motor control, there are tons of unconscious integrations. The pupillary reflex is one. All of you right now, close one eye. The other people dilated. If it didn't, contact me. You have neurological rendition. It's supposed to. Very important. So that integration occurs. Right now, my pupils are constricted because of the light. That occurs unconsciously all the time. Very complicated. It's called a consensual reflex because one eye has to have the consent of the other eye. Wilhelm Wood believed that motor control was mediated consciously, that when you grab something, the inference is going to the muscles was all mediated consciously. William James said, no, no, no. You're not aware of that stuff going to the, you're not aware of the inference to the muscles, which Wundt called the feeling of enervation. This was back in the day when introspective data were used. After a while, Wundt agreed with William James that there is no consciousness of the inferences going out to the muscles. You're aware many times of the consequences of that Efferent. So we're going to do another experiment right now. Sniff through your nose. How many of you feel like the actions are occurring here in your nose? I do. That's all just cartilage. There's very little efferents there, if any. Most of the action comes from your diaphragm and the intracostal muscles, but you're not aware of this. Humming as well. Mm -hmm. People are not aware of what is actually going on motorically. So Wundt and James actually agreed 
that there is no feeling of iteration, and then unfortunately the behaviors came and nobody talked about these things anyway. Okay, so efference binding. There are experiments, reflexes show you unconscious efference binding, but then there are also experiments where subliminal stimuli issue a response. Here is a case of a subliminal stimulus. You're gonna see a whole bunch of objects on the screen. You have to stare at the center of the screen. There's gonna be an object presented within four dots. You have to tell me what object is presented in the four dots. This is called object substitution masking. It's a very bizarre form of masking. If the object leaves the screen with the four dots, you see everything. It's a retroactive effect. The four dots being left alone wipes out the conscious experience of um, a, a diamond being there. Now, presumably, if I told you, press the trigger, if you see that object, you would have. So you would have responded to that stimulus subliminally, uh, and you would have issued the correct response. I've tried it in my laboratory many times. I can't get it, but according to the literature, it happens all the time. Now, <laughs> I just, I can I know I'm doing it wrong, probably. Anyway, um, so here are cases of integration that always involve consciousness. Holding your breath, withstanding tissue damage, suppressing consumatory behaviors, suppressing sleep onset, suppressing elimination behaviors. Now, the digestive tract, everything you want to learn about consciousness, you can learn it in the digestive tract. I will not speak about the vulgar examples that tell you the function of our lofty consciousness. But you're aware, oh, should I eat this berry that's yellow and black? And then it goes into oblivion. And then eight hours later, you're aware of it again. Uh, I will not go into that. But if you want to study the function of consciousness, the digestive tract tells you what the function is. Now, these conflicts involve high-level systems. These are not just sensory integrations. They involve high-level systems that seem to be defined not by input modality, but by their concern. So the id likes the smell of cake, the sight of cake, the sound of cake integrates all that, so you have unconscious afferent binding, but the conflict is at the level of what should the organism do. So there are these systems that have confirmed. One system says inhale, inhale, inhale. The other system says don't inhale, there's an acid in the air, right? Drop the dish, drop the dish, drop the dish. Another system says don't drop the dish, you're gonna embarrass yourself. So it seems like integration at a high level involving systems that are agentic requires consciousness. Well, what's special about this form of binding? All right, so now we have this continued contrast approach. This is a descriptive, naturalistic approach. Here we have the integrations that involve consciousness. There's Descartes' pain. Then we have ventriloquism, McGurk effect, pupillary reflex, and the control of smooth and motor control and muscle. What's the difference between this and this? These guys and these guys. It turns out the difference is not a level of control, it's not a level of complexity, it's not semantics, it's not a level of feedback. These things you find in both. I thought it was semantics. I thought when you're carrying a hot chest of food, you know it's bad, and that you don't get that from the unconscious one. There's unconscious semantics all over the place in the brain. So what's the difference? Again, it's not controllability, complexity, feedback, memory, semantics. Well, the difference is, that in the conscious conflicts, you have different systems that are trying to guide one specific effector in the body of many effectors, and it's the skeletal muscle effector or the striate muscle effector. When the conflict involves skeletal muscle, you are conscious of something going on. So this is captured by the, the term that John Barge came up with. I can never come up with a beautiful term like this, prism, parallel responses into skeletal muscle. This explains when a conflict or integration in the nervous system will perturb consciousness or not. The account is unique because it explains why intersensory conflicts are unconscious, why smooth muscle conflicts are unconscious, why you are conscious of the Stroop effect conflict. You see the word red written in blue, you have to say blue, you feel the, the conflict. Holding your breath, your conflict, you're conscious. And it explains why voluntary muscle why skeletal muscle is voluntary muscle. Skeletal muscle is quote unquote voluntary muscle because it's an effector that is guided by systems that when in order to influence it, they use these bizarre states we call consciousness as a, as a method of integration and communication. 
So, stimulus, stimulus, sensory, sensory, that could be unconscious. Stimulus response could be unconscious, like responding to a subliminal stimulus or reflexive pain withdrawal. This is what's always conscious. This is holding your breath or the Stroop task. You have two streams of stimulus response ongoing at the same time. In the Stroop task, you have to name the color in which the word is written. It conflicts with word reading. Holding your breath, carrying out hot dish of food. You have to go to the restroom, but you can't go because you're giving a lecture. All that stuff is called integrated action. So the neurological evidence makes sense. Neurological evidence, the actions look irrational and like they're not taking information into account because they are unintegrated actions, but we're talking about one effector system. So unintegrated action is withdrawing your hand from the hot stove. So you don't need consciousness to withdraw your hand from a hot stove. You need consciousness to keep touching it for some kind of reward. You may say, oh, it's just suppression. No. Integrated action is also if you breathe faster because somebody's going to give you a hundred bucks to do so. So it's not just suppression. It's cross-modulation, two systems influencing skeletal muscle at once. Now we're going to do the experiment. Everyone, release all the air in their lungs. Now don't inhale for a few seconds. All right, inhale, inhale, please. No one pass out. Okay. Did you feel an urge to inhale? Raise your hand. All of you did. In my experiments, I can't use statistics. I have no variability. All right, name the color in which this word is written as fast as you can. Red. Now do it again. How many of you felt the urge to say blue? Again, it can't do statistics. What's that? Oh, you said blue. That's, that's actually, um, the, that's called environmental contamination in psycholinguistics. All right, now here's the anti saccade task. Look, well, let's do the pro saccade condition. I'm going to show you a fixation, and then the circle is going to pop up on the screen randomly. Look at where the circle is. That's the pro saccade condition. And now we're going to do the anti saccade condition. Look at the opposite side of the screen. How many of you felt the urge to look at it? Again, now, this is really important. When the two systems give you the same action plan, look left, look left, say red, say red, you're unaware that two systems are at play. So when the action plans are harmonious, you not only know they're harmonious, you may not know two action plans are at play. When they're conflicting, then you say, oh, there were two processes. So the fights between the ego and the id is because of the conflict. If the ego and the id are aligned, eat the cake because it's tasty and healthy, then you may not even be aware of it. That's called synchrony blindness, when the action plans are... So not only does the account explain why you're aware of certain conflicts but others, it explains within the skeletal muscle system when you're not aware of the conflict. So here we have the Stroop task. You have strong response conflict. You need conscious processing. Also uh, holding your breath or... We did an experiment where people were in the scanner and they were told to prepare to go left or right like a goalie would be and they're reporting these subjective perturbations. So you get it even when there is an action expression. If you sustain incompatible skeletal muscle expressions, you get these strong conscious effects. If it's smooth muscle conflict, you don't get them. If it's harmonious action plans, you don't get them. So the pro-saccade condition is similar to the stroop congruent condition. And you get the effects with just basically telling someone to point left and right to prepare. If you're interested in all this stuff, the theory came out in Psychological Review a few years ago, Marcella Psychological Review, and there's a meta-analysis of all the evidence. It came out in NeuroCase. Um, so, it turns out that skeletal muscle is a bizarre effector system because it's a very multi-determined effector system. Eons ago, the superior colliculus and other really low-level subcortical areas told the skeletal muscle, do this, do that, when you see the cake, eat it. And then you have these other areas that are phylogenetically newer that start telling it to do different things. So the struggle of the parts problem in evolution, how do the different parts work together, is particularly pronounced for skeletal muscle because you have different brains telling it to do different things at different times. In this descriptive account, consciousness is the physical state that solves that problem for the brain. It could have been solved unconsciously. We can make a machine that solves it unconsciously. The artificial heart is not anything like the biological heart. Artificial locomotion, walking, is nothing like wheels. 
right? So evolution, for some reason, used this bizarre form of communication that involves integration and some kind of broadcasting, and we don't know why, how this system works. We don't understand what it is. So what is the difference between conscious and unconscious integration? People are now looking at the neural correlates of integrated actions versus unintegrated actions. Guess what you find over and over? More widespread regions for integrated than unintegrated. People are now looking at the frequencies. Is it more gamma? Is it more this? Is it more that? The work by Logothetis is very important. The work by Lawrence Ward at the University of British Columbia is very important uh, to answer these questions. So skeletal muscle is a steering wheel, and conscious states function like a Wi-Fi system within the brain to make the different users of that steering wheel interact. When you knock out the conscious state, you can use the steering wheel, but it won't be in an integrated fashion. It'll be just dropping the hot dish or inhaling reflexively. So we don't know what consciousness is. We're trying to explain how it falls within nature. One can say, well, consciousness doesn't do anything. But when people say Huxley's steam whistle, the sound that makes doesn't do anything, we know what the steam whistle is. We know why it makes a sound. We have no idea what this thing is. It's a form of communication that's very fast. We haven't built anything that has it. We understand how the lungs work conceptually. We can't build the lung, but we don't have an inkling regarding how this form of internal communication for integration occurs in the brain. But I, I will say this. If the heart is like a pump, and the nephron in the kidney is like a filter, then consciousness is like our everyday broadcast systems, but it's a form of broadcasting and information integration and communication that we just don't understand at all. So in several studies, we have examined the cognitive signatures and neural signatures of conscious versus unconscious conflicts and integrations. Regarding conscious conflict, we looked at a lot of interference paradigms like the Stroop, but we also did, people used to criticize me, all your conflicts are innocuous, and they're not like the conflicts of everyday life. We actually did the cold presser task where people put their hand in freezing water, and they're conflicted because they want to withdraw their hand from the freezing water. We did that task only on ourselves, though. We did, only the experimenters did it, because I couldn't put subjects through that, although we had IRB approval to do it. And I've done the cold presser task. It is very, you can't habituate to it. The water keeps moving. It's really bad. Um, and you're in a state of conflict. It turns out that the research by Ward and Logothetis, it may not be that area A has to be activated and area B be activated for you to be conscious of something. And maybe that A and B have to be interacting in a certain way. We find that a lot. In binocular rivalry, whether you're conscious of the face or of the house, is not just activation areas, it's not the loci, it's the manner in which the loci are interacting. So you will have area A and B activated, but the frequencies connecting them won't be in the proper range, and then you'll be unconscious of it. When A, area A and B are activated and the frequency range are in a certain area, then you are conscious of it. So this is an evolutionary-based descriptive account. This is like trying to find out how a, a dolphin achieves echolocation, how a bat achieves echolocation. Uh, it need not be this way. Um, people say, well, you know, everything you said I could instantiate in a neural network. And I say, everything I said I could instantiate in 50 neural networks. But that's not the way evolution came up with this problem. So this is a bottom-up, descriptive approach. We're unconscious of peristalsis. We tend to be conscious of pain. Why? We're unconscious of the McGurk effect integration. We are conscious of holding your breath integration. Thank you very much. It's been an honor to be here. There's time.